dir schaffen wir die Klimawende. Jetzt bewerben. Wiener Stadtwerke Gruppe. Whilst you listen to me speak, it is extremely likely that a woman or girl is being murdered because of her gender. Yeah, it's upsetting. It's deeply angering. And this talk is about the power that we have to change it. Statistically speaking, whilst you listen to me speak, somewhere in the world, a woman or girl is being murdered because of her gender. She is most likely being murdered by someone she knows, her partner, her ex, her father, her son, another family member. She is probably being murdered after enduring escalating abuse. Perhaps she is being murdered because her family thinks that she has dishonored them. Or perhaps she doesn't know the man who is killing her. Perhaps she is being attacked and raped and murdered by a stranger while she's walking home. Or perhaps she is dying as a result of female genital mutilation or because doctors will not perform the surgery necessary to save her life whilst they still detect a fetal heartbeat. What I'm talking about, what murders like these are defined as, is femicide. The murder of women and girls because of their gender, including trans women and other genders who are perceived as women. It is murder at the hands of individuals, but also at the hands of communities, at the hands of the courts, and at the hands of the state, as is emphasized by the Latin American concept of feminicido or feminicide. The type of femicide, the way in which these women and girls are murdered may vary, but what remains consistent is that femicide is the result of beliefs, laws, and systems that devalue the lives of women, girls, and marginalized genders. And it happens all the time. Statistics suggest that globally, a woman or girl is murdered by an intimate partner or family member once every 11 minutes. Once every 11 minutes. Murdered by someone who is supposed to love her. Of course, The frequency of femicide as a whole is even higher, but we have insufficient global data to produce an accurate estimate. Where is this happening? Everywhere. In every country in the world, across all cultures, races, and social classes. I'm speaking to you from Austria, a wealthy country in Western Europe towards the end of 2022. And so far this year, there have been 28 femicides. Each of these bedsheet banners represents one of those femicides, one of those murders, a life stolen by patriarchal violence. 18 were committed by a current or former partner. A further six were committed by another family member or relative. All of them were committed by men. Femicide is overwhelmingly committed by men. It is overwhelmingly men that are murdering us. And men, this is exactly why we need you on our side. So, you might be wondering who I am, whether I'm qualified to be speaking on this extremely sensitive topic. And sure, I was invited here today because of my punk band and because I try and talk about this stuff on stage. But a key point that I want to make with this talk is that we are all qualified to speak up. Yes, we absolutely do need specialists, we do need experts, but we are all qualified to speak up. Why? Because we are all experts in our own lives and communities, and that is where the change needs to be made. I'm going to present six broad ways that we can do this that are backed up by the research, and you'll be able to come back to this slide at a later point if you want to find out more. I do particularly want to credit the words and wisdom of feminist activist Janie Starling. These six points are, of course, geared to a more Western context and are absolutely colored by my own experiences as a white, cisgender British woman. And by cisgender, I just mean that I'm not transgender. I'm not going to pretend that I know about your life. You are the expert in that. 
but the beliefs, systems, and values that cause femicide exist all over the world. And I have deliberately made these points as broad as possible so that they might be applied very differently in different contexts. You know best to what extent they apply to yours and crucially, how safe it is to do so or what you're willing to risk. So, here we are. Six broad ways that we have the power to contribute to ending femicide. Number one, by challenging gender roles and inequalities. The research shows us that whereas the murder of men is most closely linked to socioeconomic issues, the murder of women is most closely linked to gender roles and inequalities. There is so much that we can do to change this. We can stop treating children differently on the basis of gender. We can let them all play with dolls and tools and footballs. We can stop telling little girls to be quiet. And we can stop giving boys a pass for aggressive behavior under the guise of boys will be boys. No, boys are better than that. Boys are not born violent. We need to build a world where they don't become so. What about the adults? Do we judge women differently for their sexual behavior? Do we expect more unpaid work and sacrifice from women? Do we believe men more readily than we believe women? We can look at our communities and where there is one rule for men and another for women, we can break those rules. We've been breaking them for generations. Together, we can challenge gender roles at a societal level and dissolve this key impetus for the murder of women, girls, and marginalized genders. And this is precisely why the trans struggle is such a vital part of our movement. Because simply by existing in all of their beauty and all of their bravery, trans people are tearing down a binary view of gender that underpins violence towards women and ultimately harms every single one of us, including men. We need to challenge gender roles, and points two and three hone in specifically on toxic forms of masculinity. Number two, we need to challenge aggressive masculinity. We need to challenge macho bullshit. Men, this one's really over to you. There is plenty of evidence to show that aggressive masculinity has a negative impact on your mental health, as well as underpinning violence towards women and marginalized genders. Femicide is overwhelmingly committed by men, but men, boys, are not born violent. We need men to unlearn the violence that society teaches them and create caring, positive, emotionally literate versions of masculinity, for your own sake, as well as ours. Point three, we need to end male entitlement. What so often underpins men's aggression towards women is entitlement, an expectation of attention, affection, labor, even sex from us, revealed by anger or violence when it is denied. An extreme example of this is incel culture, a recent phenomenon, but an increasing threat. Incels are young men who are radicalizing each other on online forums to believe that they are entitled to sex from women and inciting each other to punish us when we don't give it to them. Some are then carrying out terror attacks, mass shootings, committing femicide as a result. We need to collectively reject this pervasive idea that men are owed something from women. We need more of the brilliant organizations that exist around the world challenging entitled aggressive forms of masculinity. And we need men to challenge other men in their day-to-day -day lives, to challenge their friends, to practice bystander intervention, and to question their own expectations. She doesn't owe you a smile. She doesn't owe you sex. She doesn't owe you anything. Point four, we need to disconnect our idea of love from ownership. Be mine, I'm yours. A sense of ownership is deep rooted in our ideas about love. 
The very institution of marriage is built on laws that have historically treated and in some places still treat women as the property of men. Now, I'm not saying don't get married. I love weddings. I love free Prosecco. I love love. I love celebrating it. But I do think we have some big questions to ask ourselves about how we understand love as well as what we define as romantic behaviors. A sense of ownership, possessiveness, jealousy. You can find it everywhere, in song lyrics, in poems, in movies, in pop culture, in all of the ways that we co-create our view of romance. But think about it, because pursuing someone who has left you or who is clearly not interested isn't romantic, it's literally stalking. And possessiveness and jealousy, these are not loving behaviors. They are the foundation of coercive control, which can, the research shows us, lead to femicide. In cases of intimate partner violence, in cases of intimate partner femicide, that's femicide committed by a current or former partner, the research emphasizes the murderer's sense of ownership over the victim. This kind of femicide is the most common, accounting for roughly one third of femicides globally. In the UK, where I'm from, a woman is murdered by a current or former partner once every four days. Here in Austria, 18 of the 28 femicides so far this year were intimate partner femicides. We need to disconnect our idea of love from ownership we need to stop romanticizing controlling and abusive behaviors. Point five, it is your business. Now, most of us, if we witness harassment or we hear about controlling or abusive behavior, look the other way, especially us Brits. We say, oh no, that's none of my business or oh well, you know, what happens behind closed doors? On top of that, most of us don't even know what happens behind closed doors because we don't even know our neighbors. The research suggests that strengthening community ties could decrease the risk of femicide. We need to look after each other. We need to offer each other support and find ways to safely intervene if violence is escalating. In the words of UK gender justice organization Level Up, we look after us. Point six, last point, protest. I'm part of a feminist group here in Austria called F-Strike Graz. And along with groups like Neon Amenos Austria and Claim the Space Vienna, we hold monthly demonstrations to protest every single femicide that takes place in Austria. We paint our banners onto bedsheets to emphasize that the private, the personal is political to turn a domestic item into a political statement, to take femicide from the home, where it is most likely to take place, out into the streets. To make it visible, to name it, because you cannot change what you cannot name. We take our banners onto the streets to mourn, to grieve these lives stolen by patriarchal violence, but we also go on the streets to make demands. And we have a lot of demands but some key examples. We demand that the media stops perpetuating the narratives that kill us, narratives that blame us for our own murders, and that the media names these murders for what they are, femicide. We demand better sex and relationship education in our schools, the same in our workplaces. We demand universal basic income so that nobody has to stay for financial reasons in a violent relationship. We demand more funding for domestic violence services and specialist services for LGBTQI plus people and migrants because as I said at the start, we need specialists, we need experts, and we need to demand that the state makes this a priority and funds it properly. We cannot leave this up to governments. We certainly can't leave it up to the police. We are also experts. We are experts in our own lives and communities, and it is up to us to challenge gender roles and inequalities, to challenge aggressive masculinity, to end male entitlement. It is up to us to 
disconnect our idea of love from ownership and to stop romanticizing abusive and controlling behaviors. It is up to us to stick our noses in and make the safety of our friends and neighbors our business. And it is up to us to name femicide for what it is and to demand better from each other, from the media, and from the state. We cannot bring back the woman or girl who was murdered whilst you listen to me speak today. But we can start to make the kind of changes that I have suggested and I truly believe that there will come a year where we don't paint any banners, where not one single woman, girl, person is murdered because of their gender. Let's take inspiration. Let's follow the lead of the radical, colossal Ni Una Menos movement fighting femicide in Latin America. The feminist revolution persisting against all odds in Rojava. The movement led by women and teenage girls rising up in Iran following the femicide of a Kurdish woman, Gina Massa Amini, at the hands of the morality police. The women resisting the Taliban in Afghanistan. The feminist revolution is happening all over the world and it is up to us to bring that revolution into our own communities. And we're going to bring the spirit of that revolution into this room today because I am going to shout some slogans from that movement and you are going to repeat them back to me. Yes? Yes? yes. All right. So from Iran to Latin America, from here in Vienna to wherever you are watching this video. Jin, Jian, Azadi! Jin, Jian, Azadi!